Well, another week, another major news story related to UFOs. The New York Times is reporting about the contents of a soon-to-be-released Pentagon investigation into the UFO mystery. The 2017 New York Times article, that was a big shift because when the New York Times is reporting about it and saying that this is major news and this is real and there's video evidence that they can't ignore, it starts to change the conversation in a lot of people's eyes. Now we have multiple sightings by multiple modes. That is the gold standard, the gold standard for looking for these objects, not just radar, but visual sighting, infrared sensors, uh, telescopic evidence. Now we have multiple sightings by multiple modes. And so the burden of proof has shifted to the Pentagon, to the military. Now they have to prove that these aren't extraterrestrial. You know, 50 years ago, there was a congressional hearing and it was coming out of Project Blue Book. And there was a lot of laughter and a lot of jokes about things, little green men in outer space. 50 years ago, that's the way it was. Now things have changed. Now people are looking at, looking at, are they a threat militarily? What kinds of sensors do we have? What kind of metrics do we have? We now have frame by frame an analysis of these objects. These objects travel between Mach 5 and Mach 20. That's 20 times the speed of sound. These objects can zigzag and we can measure the G-force inside the, this object. The G-forces are several hundred times the force of gravity. These objects can drop 70,000 feet in a few seconds, and they can go underwater. This is something that we didn't realize before, but yes, they can actually go underwater. And they also move without creating an exhaust or breaking the sound barrier. So these are things that we can now document frame by frame looking at these videotapes. Now, when I was first approached by Carolyn Corey, uh, the producer of this film, A Tear in the Sky, I was skeptical. I said to myself, come on, I mean, five days, five days you're gonna look for flying saucers in the sky. So I was pleasantly surprised when they actually found something. They actually have photographic evidence of objects that can gyrate just the way the Pentagon has said. Wow, Tic Tacs, maybe Tic Tacs. Maybe. Caught on our cameras, yep. that's incredible. Well, the Pentagon has listed, I think, five different options. Uh, one option, of course, is that they're weather balloons or something that's an artifact of our space program. Maybe uh, a piece of rocket uh, that is, is plunging back into the Earth's atmosphere. Anomalous uh, weather events, uh, they happen and they have to be looked at very carefully. But the last option, the last option is other. One possibility for other is hypersonic drones. Mm. We see that in warfare now. The Russians in the battle of Ukraine is actually using hypersonic drones to hit targets inside Ukraine. Uh, to be hypersonic, you have to go faster than Mach 5. Anything faster than five times the speed of sound is called hypersonic. And so the Russians are now fielding hypersonic drones in warfare. But you see, this is something just in the last few months. These sightings, they go back decades into the past with objects executing these gyrations decades ago. And that's why you have to take them seriously. We're talking about objects that defy the known laws of aerodynamics with a technology beyond what we have today. Whose are these things? These objects create no sonic booms. When you exceed the sound barrier, uh, you create a gigantic boom. These objects can effortlessly uh, break the sound barrier and not create a sonic boom. And they don't create any exhaust. Uh, we don't see an exhaust trail from these objects. So either they're an optical illusion of some sort or they have a set of laws of physics beyond what we, what, what we can muster. If an object were to move in front of your eyes, traveling at a very slow velocity, but you don't know how far they are away, you may think that object is very far away from you, traveling at enormous velocities. So a weather balloon drifting in front of your eyes can simulate an object traveling at hypersonic velocities if you think that weather balloon is far away from you. So how do you tell the difference? Well, you look at wind patterns. It turns out that many of these sightings, these objects defy the direction of the wind. If they are weather balloons that you confuse with a flying saucer, uh, then they would be moving with the direction of the wind. But these objects do not do that. These objects can go against the direction of the wind. Not only that, but we have multiple sightings. If an object is close to you, but you think it's far away, then, it, then it's traveling at an enormous velocity while it's actually just drifting in front of your eyes. How do you tell the difference? By having multiple sensors, radar, 
infrared sensors, visual sighting. Then you can tell how far this object is away from you, and then you can say that, nope, it's an optical illusion. And so that's why we're scratching our heads. Who has this capability? And the answer is, we don't know. But open your mind to the possibility that they are a thousand years more advanced than us. A thousand years is nothing compared to the age of the universe. Right. The universe is about 13 billion plus years old. That's how the age of the universe. And so the age of a civilization, just a few thousand years ahead of us, that is just a blink of an eye to the universe itself. And once you go to higher energies, the laws of physics begin to break down. The laws of Einstein and the laws of the quantum theory break down at something called the Planck energy. The Planck energy is 10 to the 19 billion electron volts. That is a quadrillion times more powerful than our most powerful atom smasher outside Geneva, Switzerland. Any civilization that can harness the Planck energy would be able to become masters of space and time. Space and time as we know it become unstable at the Planck energy, which is far beyond anything that we can muster here on the planet Earth. So we physicists theorize, how advanced do you have to be to access the Planck energy? Well, we rank them. The Kardashev scale says that there could be type one, type two, or type three civilizations. A type one civilization is maybe a hundred years more advanced than us to maybe a thousand years. Type two is stellar. They harness the power of an entire star. Then there's type three. Type three is galactic. They roam the galactic space lanes. They play with black holes. Then the next question is, what type do you have to be to harness the Planck energy? The energy at which space and time become unstable, where wormholes may develop, gateways through space and time, portals through empty space. You have to be type two or most likely type three. Then the next question is, how long will it take before you become type three? Well, we are maybe a hundred years away from being type one. We're maybe a few thousand years from being from type two, and we're maybe a hundred thousand years being from being type three. And a hundred thousand years is nothing, nothing on a galactic scale. The age of the universe is, as I said, over 13 billion years old. And so once a civilization reaches the Planck energy, that is a type three civilization, space and time become your playground. We just had something go right over the top of us. I hate to say it, this looked like a long cylindrical object. It almost looked like a cruise missile type of thing moving really fast that went right over the top of us. You do believe that the aliens do exist? The aliens are not there. The aliens are here. They're among us. I get a lot of emails and some of them say, Professor, you're wrong. You're totally wrong. The aliens are not there. The aliens are here. They're among us. And how do they know? These people claim that they've been kidnapped. They've been kidnapped by aliens and they've been in the flying saucers. When you're walking down a forest and you meet a squirrel, do you go down to the squirrels and talk to it? Well, maybe initially, hey, hi, squirrel. But eventually you get bored because the squirrel has nothing to say to you. If we are the squirrels and aliens from outer space land on the earth, what do we have to offer them? Shakespeare? Well, maybe they don't <clears throat> understand English. What do we have to offer them? Gold? Gold means nothing to them. In fact, gold is rather a useless metal for an advanced civilization. What do they want? They eat us? We're not gonna be made out of the same DNA. They're not gonna wanna eat us or mate with us or do anything with our genome. We're totally different from them. So I think for the most part, they'll leave us alone. They'll say, oh, nice squirrel, and leave us alone. You do believe that the aliens do exist? That's a check, right? Yeah, that's a check. There's a group called the METI Project, which deliberately, deliberately sends signals into outer space saying, here we are, here's what we like, this is what we can do, and visit us sometime. I think that's a bad idea because we don't know what their intentions are. Maybe they've been scanning us. Maybe they know pretty much where, what our technological development level is. They know a lot about us, our language, our culture. They're pretty advanced. But for the most part, we're not interesting to them. But one day, if we advertise our existence and reveal how much we have, 
resources, minerals, perhaps things that are of value to an alien civilization. So I think for the most part, it's a bad idea to advertise our existence to aliens in outer space. In other words, maybe we're off the radar. Let's keep it that way for a while. I think aliens probably have more important things to worry about because if you are a, uh, a person walking in a forest, there are lots of forest animals out there. Some forest animals are probably more interesting than squirrels. And so I think there's a lot more interesting things for them to be preoccupied with. Got and it. so I think for the most part, we should lie low. You know, we've analyzed 4,000 planets so far, 4,000. Uh, of which roughly 20% seem to be Earth-like. Now that expanded to the galaxy means that there are billions, billions of Earth-like planets, maybe a little bit bigger than the Earth, but billions of Earth-like planets out there. To assume that we are the only one, I think, is the height of arrogance. Many of my friends, you know, they're all physicists. When you talk aliens to them, their eyes kind of like roll up into the heavens and they start to shake their heads. That's the giggle factor, that whenever you talk to them about that. And why do they giggle? They say the distance between stars is so great, it would take hundreds, thousands of years for them to reach us. But you see, that assumes they are a hundred years ahead of us. And of course, a hundred years ahead of us, a civilization like that cannot reach the Earth. But for the moment, Think of what could happen if they are a million years ahead of us. If they were a million years ahead of us, and our science is only 300 years old, 300 years ago we lived in witchcraft, sorcery, magic. That's where we were 300 years ago. If they're a million years ahead of us, which is a blink of an eye, a blink of an eye because the universe is 13.8 billion years old, then think that their understanding of the laws of physics would be completely different from our understanding of the laws of physics. You see, our understanding of the laws of physics break down. Break down at the instant of creation, the Big Bang, and the center of a black hole. We don't know anything about the center of a black hole or the instant of creation. New laws of physics open up. Perhaps wormholes, gateways that allow us to go faster than the speed of light. And so get rid of all your prejudices that they can't reach us because they're, they're only 100 years ahead of us. If there are millionaires ahead of us, new laws of physics begin to open up.